Um, today's session on autism and mental health will be looking at the mental health challenges faced by autistic people. My name is Jana Vigor. I use she, her pronouns. I am currently uh, sitting in the patient and family learning space in downtown Toronto at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. And I will be doing a brief introduction before handing it off to our presenters today. Today, we welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Meng Xuan Lai, and guiding the discussion from the Azrieli Center are Riley Goldsmith, a youth engagement specialist and autistic self-advocate, and Alex Ekovitz, youth engagement specialist and autistic self-advocate. My name is Riley Goldsmith, and I am a youth engagement specialist and autistic self-advocate at CAMH. As a disabled autistic adult with direct and extensive experience with the mental health system, I work to further research and understanding of the intersection of disabilities and mental health. I'm passionate about education and fostering positive change in the neurodiverse community through novel and accessible mediums, as well as the ongoing development of creative works and tools in mental health education. Now I'll pass it on to my co-presenter, Alex. Thank you, Riley. Hello, everyone. I'm Alex Ekovitz. My pronouns are they, them. Uh, I wear many different hats. Uh, one of them is uh, I am a program engagement co-facilitator, uh, also known as a youth engagement specialist here at CAMH. Uh, I work to help make sure that uh, voices uh, of youth, uh, particularly those with uh, neurodevelopmental disabilities, are heard. And, uh, uh, and that that feedback is properly incorporated and reflected in the work that CAMH does. Uh, in my personal life, I am a queer, autistic, mad person living with uh, multiple different disabilities. Uh, and uh, some of those uh, intersect with autism quite a bit, uh, which is, why it is my great pleasure to now introduce uh, Dr. Meng Chuan Lai, who will, uh, who is a, a psychiatrist and senior scientist at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, CAMH. Uh, Dr. Lai's work focuses on neurobiological, cognitive, sociocultural, and health service research, clinical services to improve mental health and well-being of neurodivergent individuals across sexes and gender. Welcome, Dr. Lyon. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you, Alex and Riley. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, anyone who's on the web. Uh, just make sure everyone can see the slide and hear me all right. Perfect. So my name is Meng Chen Lai, and I am a, a child and youth and adult psychiatrist at CAMH, and I also do research uh, related to uh, well-being and mental health of neurodivergent people and families. And it's really great to have the chance to be here and discuss and share with all of you about this topic that I'm really passionate about. And I also learned a lot about uh, through the years of learning. Um, I'm a first generation immigrant to Canada, spent uh, quite a few years um, before coming to Canada in Taiwan and UK and have some experiences there. What I'm going to present today um, is outlined in these order, and I will first introduce a little bit about uh, the neurodevelopmental and other physical health conditions that usually co-occur with autism that can underlie mental health issues. And then I'll briefly introduce the major mental health challenges that has been faced by autistic people, and then dive into some selective, but not all uh, clinical topics uh, that may have some importance, especially for um, uh, autistic individuals and families in recognizing them. And then I will propose some ideas about how we can understand the origins of mental health challenges in the context of autism. And then based on that idea to think about clinical support. And have to um, first apologize um, that um, some of the contents uh, you know, included here 
um, are directly taken from published literature. So some of the nomenclature used there is directly taken from there. So may not be you know, most uh, well like, uh, suited for um, uh, what's uh, taken as you know the, um, the the most respectful language used. So for example, you will see the label autism spectrum disorder in some of the cited contents there. But just wanna acknowledge that's directly citation from the literature. Um, I try to keep things as evidence based as possible, but uh, um, there will be many aspects that's um, based on clinical anecdotes and also shared experiences from people. So um, those should be uh, viewed as my personal view and uh, I will try to make sure that I address them uh, as clearly as possible. And finally, some contents have quite a bit of uh, intense text in it. So I'll try to go over the most important parts, but I'm happy to share the slides um, with, uh, with the audience uh, um, uh, in the future, just for your further reference. So let's take a look at the autism co-occurring conditions in the neurodevelopmental and physical health aspects. So first of all, as we all know, autism is considered as neurodevelopmental, meaning that this is a makeup of a person that's uh, present from very early in life. And what we know is that these neurodevelopmental features altogether considered neurodivergence uh, actually overlaps quite a lot. So if one has been diagnosed with autism, it's quite likely or there's increased likelihood the person may also experience features of ADHD or uh, motor related issues termed as motor disorder, for example, tics, uh, or uh, learning related issues, uh, including uh, something that's not considered disorder, but they're really important for functioning, for example, executive function challenges. Many people who are neurodivergent also have communication related challenges. Some of them may have difficulty using understanding language. Um, some people may also have intellectual developmental challenges. So these neurodevelopmental conditions tend to co-occur and they may have shared origin and they all have impact uh, with um, the well-being of the individual later in life, depending on how a person is treated by the context. The other important thing is that many physical conditions can also co-occur. So there are a lot of bars here, but uh, let me just try to walk people through. This is uh, a kind of like a uh, account or of the prevalence of um, certain conditions from health registry database from, from California. Uh, for young adults, uh, so 14 to 25 year old youth age range. On the left hand side, this is um, people, uh, autistic people who have ASD diagnosis. The second bar here is what they call um, control group, so people who do not have diagnosis. They also compare that with people who have ADHD diagnosis and those who have diabetes diagnosis. So as you can see, it does vary quite a bit in terms of who, um, uh, in terms of the rates of diagnosis. Uh, autistic people may have a bit more prevalent of um, al allergy, immune related issues, cardiovascular issues, gastrointestinal issues, uh, neurological issues, including epilepsy, all the way to overweight, obesity, to psychiatric issues, sleep issues, compared to um, so-called typically developing people. Some of these you know, may be more prevalent for those who have, uh, for example, medical conditions like diabetes, so people have diabetes, have more issues with gastrointestinal infection or um, obesity, overweight related issues. However, psychiatric condition is actually the most prevalent ones in autistic people compared to uh, other groups in this particular study. So what are the mental health issues that's most commonly reported? And let's just take a look at these, like these two squares, boxes. Um, there is um, um, a, a lot of literature on the rate of the diagnosis, and not to say the, like the symptoms is probably even more prevalent. But if we only look at the rate, this is what we call a meta-analysis, basically having a summary number across what has been published there. And there are at least eight uh, diagnoses that has been reported quite frequently, so we can get a quite representative summary number. That includes ADHD, anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, bipolar disorders, schizophrenia spe uh, spectrum disorder, OPS, uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, impulse control related issues, and sleep disorders. And 
in the red box here, this is like the summary rate across all the literature. And these literature is quite uh, variable. Some of them are from what we call population-based studies. Some of them are from clinical, um, so like, um, clinical studies. So it's a mixture. But in any case, the average number for um, the rate or the prevalence rate of egg diagnosis in autistic population is about 28% for ADHD, 20% for anxiety disorders, 11% for depressive disorders, 5% for bipolar, 4% for schizophrenia and um, um, spe schizophrenia spectrum, 9% for OCD, 12 for what they call disruptive impulse control, and then 13 for sleep wake disorder. And these rates are all higher than the general population rates, which is given later in this column. So suggesting that across the board, autistic people do have higher rates of these mental health uh, diagnosis as reported by the literature. And what is important here is that assigned sex seems to play a role. So this is some recent data from the Swedish registry, and they basically counted the possibility or the instance rate of a new mental health diagnosis in autistic people aged from 16 all the way to 25. They found that autistic female assigned at birth actually had the highest rate of uh, being, being given a diagnosis over this period of time, up to even more than 70%, followed by autistic male assigned at birth, followed by uh, non-autistic female assigned at birth, as you can see, up to 20%, uh, all the way to 25 year old, then followed by non-autistic males assigned at birth. So again, this is a sort of clear message, at least from a statistic point of view, uh, especially within the youth age range, uh, new mental health diagnosis seem to um, be more uh, likely um, given to autistic people and especially autistic females assigned at birth. If we move on to some of these um, common topics as we highlighted earlier, uh, what are the important things for us to be aware so we, we can recognize the potential mental health challenges experienced um, during lifetime? Anxiety is really one of the most common symptom sets and sometimes you know it is severe enough that it like, interferes with function so a disorder uh, may be diagnosed because of this, uh, the intensity of that and also the functional impairment. What is important there is that usually there is a collection of anxiety that has been described by mental health professionals. So for example, separation anxiety, which is usually more so for children than older people, is basically difficulty separating from caregivers or family members. Social phobia, which is essentially a, uh, a fear that interfere with interacting with people socially because of uh, negative experiences in the past, but also a fear of being uh, judged or um, uh, uh, basically f f uh, worrying about how other people may look, may, may evaluate oneself. Specific phobia relates to fear to specific things or experiences or items or places. Um, for example, needle phobia or animal phobia, that's like impairing one's daily function. Generalized anxiety refers to excessive or like very strong worries about a lot of things across the lifespan. Like it could be really literally anything, everything in life that's really impairing. And obsessive compulsive disorder is you know partly anxiety, but now we understand it's actually a separate category by itself because it includes lots of what we call um, uh, un uh, hard to control intrusive thoughts that's not pleasant that we want to get it away, but it just stays there. It's just, it's just hard to, to put it away. And then something, sometimes we need to do something mentally or physically to get rid of that thought. And that's altogether considered OCD. So these are more like the classical type that mental health professionals are familiar with. Um, however, there are some anxiety manifestation that's unique in autistic people that may not be well recognized, but they are actually there, they're present. So Dr. Corner Kearns uh, at the British Columbia uh, had done great research looking at what are the kinds of what we call autism related anxieties there. And there are at least five different categories that has been recognized. So for example, social fear relay, uh, refers to the worries, not about being judged by other people, not about being evaluated by other people, but basically about interacting with people in new environment or fear related to social overload. 
Uncommon phobia, it could be something not specific enough as what has usually been highlighted in specific phobia. It could be something as a specific sound, some specific color, some specific image that usually may not be an issue for most neurotypical people, but it is bothering for some specific autistic people. Special interest fear uh, uh, relates to um, a worry of uh, not able to have access to the things that's comforting and uh, being one of the focused or intense interests. So the worry of not being able to access what I'm so enthusiastic, passionate and focused about. Fear of change is very, uh, very much un uh, understandable. Autistic people needs routine, it needs predictability. So if predictability or routine has been disrupted, that will cause immense anxiety. And that also includes negative reactions to change, which may not be verbalized as anxiety. So many of these forms may not fit well with those like square boxes of the traditional anxiety, but they are there. So it is important that we are able to recognize these so like autism specific ones, but also the clinicians should be able to recognize these autism specific anxieties. And from one of Dr. Kern's study, we can see that the prevalence rates uh, are actually quite, quite, it's actually quite large. So for example, in one of the cohorts, only 17% of them have only the traditional anxieties, about 15% of them have only the atypical anxieties, but more than 30% of them actually have a mixture of both traditional and the, uh, the, so the atypical or autism specific anxieties. So we have to be very much aware of these kinds of anxieties. Depression is another very so important feature to look for. And the Recognition of depression, is, the criteria basically is still the same as what we understand about depression across the general population, but autistic people may uh, experience them in unique ways, and this may be uh, related to how an autistic person processes information related to emotions or what we call the internal physical feelings, and these um, 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 so like, uh, capability or uh, in terms of uh, being aware and communicate these feelings may uh, interfere with how a depression a manifestation can be recognized by clinicians or by other people. Um, this comes from a joint project from um, a, a group at ChemH, and I believe Riley is also part of the team. It's led by Dr. St Stephanie Amos. Uh, it's actually an open access document published by the Condal Center at ChemH. It's a, a guide, a used to use guide on coping and getting help related to depression. So this table gives us some example of uh, how the depression um, like manifestations can be experienced by autistic people. So for example, um, the uh, lack of uh, pleasure or interest in doing things, uh, you know, can, can be manifested as feeling apathetic or being less enthusiastic about the interest and hobbies that has been there, especially the focused interest. Uh, feeling down and, and depressed and low may not necessarily be like low or crying every day, but it could be feeling numb, sad or lonely and persistently. And if it's like that's persistent, it's hard to, uh, to get back to the normal of the person, then it's really indicative of something that we need to think about related to depression. Um, difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, uh, it can actually be sleeping more or less. It doesn't have to be sleeping less. It could actually be sleeping a lot more than the, the normal of the person. Change of appetite can definitely be reduced intake or increased intake. Um, feeling guilty uh, and bad about oneself is also quite prominent, like thinking negatively about oneself or thinking about the future prospects or even looking down upon oneself pretty substantially. Change in energy relates to feeling tired feeling having little energy or easily overwhelmed, finding hard to uh, cope with things that uh, we, we were able to cope in the past. Although that might actually differ from day to day. Also, it could be feeling restless and cannot stick to one thing at a time. Um, it could also to the extent of becoming slower in motion, in act, in talking that can be recognized by other people. Then thinking speed can also change. So some people describe it as brain fog, or it could be uh, having trouble concentrating on doing things that we used to like. Um, thinking about hurting oneself um, is a serious one. Um, in autistic people, for some people, that can be represented as a focus 
into a um, so-called darker side of life or even fascination on death or self-harm related issues. Uh, physical pain is not a criteria included in the so-called uh, DSM, but it is actually very commonly experienced by people who have depression, autistic and non-autistic alike. So more pain experienced than usual, um, or even having a high pain threshold than usual. These are all like, considered maybe related to the atypical sensory processing that's linked here. And speaking on that, aut autistic people also shared that uh, when experiencing depression, the sensory modality can actually be, be changing and it could be even more bothersome in terms of the originally um, like sensory um, related like, uh, thresholds. So basically something that's not so bothering, if you, one can tolerate, becomes more overwhelming for an autistic person. Um, and then, you know, feeling like less capable to handle these like day-to-day -day environmentally driven challenges. Sleep is a big issue and I apologize for this very tense text, but basically this is a summary of what kind of sleep issue that might have been experienced by autistic people that does vary from insomnia, difficulty falling to sleep, all the way to have a change of circadian rhythm. So e either sleeping too late or sleeping too early, or it's a very irregular rhythm, or uh, it's harder to fall into sleep. So you spend a lot of time, an hour, two hours, three hours on the bed, but just cannot fall into sleep, or the total sleep time has reduced, uh, or what we call poor sleep efficiency. So basically the time spent on bed um, is quite long, but on the time really like in sleeping, especially in deep sleeping, is shorter than what is usually expected. Autistic people can also experience parasomnia, which refers to um, some like, behavior or talking that's happening uh, during sleep, so one is not aware of what's happening. And also sleep-related breathing disorder like sleep apnea uh, has also been reported. Trauma is a big topic, and there is one what we call meta-analysis, again, like summarizing what has been published in terms of the preference rate of trauma-related events. And the summary rate there is 44% of autistic people have experienced uh, you know, significant levels of trauma in their life. In this case, what people mean by trauma actually cuts across a, a, a wide range of adverse experiences, all the way from being abused, bullied, maltreated, neglect, to more serious kind of um, um, even crime uh, directed to autistic people. So this is really an important topic that we should be aware of. I want to highlight a few um, it's like emerging phenomena that people, uh, are, especially from the uh, lived expertise from autistic people, that are being uh, uh, talked more about and people are starting to be aware of it, although the operationalization of these or like the, clinics, um, the clinician's knowledge on these are still developing. But these are important phenomena that needs to be highlighted, so we need to be all aware of. The um, description of autistic burnout refers to a significant exhaustion and usually it's a withdrawal from interpersonal interactions and reduced functioning and more executive function difficulties and even increased manifestation of autistic traits. Autistic inertia has been described as the difficulty starting or stopping activities with this internal experiences of tendency to maintain the state as is and difficulty finding the first step to start. Meltdown has been described as a feeling of entirely overwhelmed by the information, the senses, or the social and emotional stress, and there's a lack of control and the cumulative uh, stress experienced by the autistic person. And shutdown is a similar experience there, but refers more of an internal experience uh, that the autistic person withdraws from surroundings and experience a lot of emotional pain in the state. And whether these um, experiences may be related to what we know actually for psychiatrists for years of catatonia is still not, too, not very clear, but it is important to recognize catatonia can actually happen in autistic people. Catatonia is the state uh, describing psychomotor disturbances. So either decreased speech and motor, uh, motor ability, for example, a person becomes mute totally or becomes uh, uh, ambivalent in terms of what to do, so actually looks like staying there, but there's a lot of struggle within here, or increased 
um, psychomotor activity like uh, excitement or even agitation for no clear reasons and not provoked. Or we uh, talked about abnormal psychomotor ability, for example, some mannerism that's not part of autistic person's makeup, um, echo phenomenon that's not part of what we um, an autistic person usually have. So when we say echo, it means that some people say something and the autistic person would actually repeat that, repeat what they hear. Uh, when they see another person do something, they will repeat what they see. Uh, but this is almost like automatic reaction to that. Uh, or just repeating uh, words, uh, again, not at the baseline of what the autistic person has, um, has experienced in the past. So this is a phenomenon uh, in its classical form in the past seen in people who experience psychotic episodes. But now we understand that autistic person can experience these even without the presence of psychosis. And especially it could be characterized as uh, having a gradual onset of also like what we call the slowness of motor and speech, and then marked hesitation during movements with initiation difficulties. So that's like similar to, or you know, overlapping with what has been described as inertia and reliance on others prompts to do that and reduce speech and mutism or feeling mentally freezing or stuck in the loop, which can be related to uh, obsessive compulsive uh, symptoms or even the shutdown phenomenon. And then even, you know, agitation or self-injurious behaviors that's not clearly provoked by uh, uh, the, the interaction with the environment. So it is really important that we keep this in mind, especially for clinicians, that this like marked difference of psychomotor behavior that's different from the baseline may actually imply a state that would need intervention and support. And these usually happen, uh, not usually often happen when autistic person is overloaded by sensory, environmental, or social communication demands. I want to highlight substance a little bit because um, there is a recent large-scale survey over a thousand people asking about the reason uh, autistic and non-autistic people use substance. And then uh, there is uh, this like, thematic analysis of the reason why people use it. Uh, and what they analyzed is that they compare autistic adults with non-autistic adults and asking about are there any differences in the reasons of using substance and they found autistic people are more likely to report using substance to manage the behavior difficulties they experience in life so here uh, which usually means to help them feel alert managing autistic related presentations reducing sensory overload and they feel they function better for daily life on on, medic, uh, on substance or help them improve quality of life and also to manage mental health symptoms, for example, suicidal ideations, depression, anxiety. So it is really important to understand that for some autistic people, if they do use substance, in many cases, the initial motivation may be related to the need for, for managing um, uh, difficulties in life and probably particularly mental health challenges. So it's a quick summary of some of the topics is not ex exhaustive, but I hope it gives um, a, a bit of a, a general idea of what are the key points to look for. Now I want to, sh I want to shift a little bit um, to what we understand about uh, the why, like why do autistic people may experience more of the challenges. One important uh, phenomenon or like social interaction pattern is now termed the double empathy problem. And this idea is like, uh, in response to the traditional myth that autistic people have a uh, lack of empathy, which is not true uh, because the, empathy, the term empathy is actually too mixed. Um, autistic people may have difficulty figuring out what non-autistic non people may be thinking. So that's what we call mentalizing. But autistic people do not have difficulty with uh, so like, um, sympathizing other people or having an affective response to other people's uh, emotions or behaviors or pain. So there's a, um, a variety of what we call affective empathy, but the idea of a lack of empathy is not true. But that is a myth and that is a misunderstanding has been posed to autistic people for many years. So um, uh, Damien Milton, um, uh, a sociologist in the UK, proposed this idea 10 years ago saying that the difficulties experienced by autistic people is not originated only from autistic people. There could be challenges for autistic people to read between the lines or overcome other people's misconception or managing sensory distractions or having communication challenges. 
but the so-called misunderstanding or communication breakdown between the people is partly also accounted by non-autistic people finding it difficult to understand autistic people. So for example, non-autistic people tend to have a stigmatization of autistic people and have more likely to have a negative first impression to autistic people compared to non-autistic people. They may have difficulty recognizing autism to start with, and they may be difficulty like putting themselves in the shoes of autistic people's daily living experiences. And the reason I want to highlight this is that this is so important um, because it, we need a lot of communication, a lot of sharing, and a lot of like mutual help to understand uh, each other between the neurotypes. It's, it's the same as you know people trying to understand each other across culture, across ethnic groups, across people with different origins, and that applies here. And autistic people do report that the alliance or relationship that they have with their health provi healthcare providers is actually key for a better healthcare, including mental health care that they have. So it is so crucial that clinicians uh, are aware uh, of these barriers, uh, which is not the fault of anyone, but it actually requires effort to put in for better understanding. And I think that is actually one of the most important key uh, reasons for some of the mental health challenges uh, experienced by autistic people. And this is a very scary plot, but I just want to highlight those red box. And as you can see, these pie charts represents the correlation of the genetic factors associated with autism and genetic factors associated with uh, other human traits. And these genetic factors are what we call common variants. So these are the like commonly present uh, factors accounting for height, weight, you know, skin color, uh, a range of other things. So for autism, these genetic factors are positively associated with uh, education attainment, IQ across adulthood and childhood, and also uh, some level of substance use and major depression and ADHD, as well as bipolar and schizophrenia. So these are what we call common variants. So they exist in the general population and you cannot really identify the effect of single of them. It's like there's this cumulative effect across like thousands of them. Um, uh, so, so, so we cannot pinpoint any of them, but the joint effect of them do account for autistic traits or autism diagnosis. Um, but also higher educational attainment and IQ, as well as some mental health challenges, including what we call severe mental illnesses like major depression, bipolar, and schizophrenia. There are something what we call rare variants. So these are like a new change of the, of, the, of the genome of the person that happens, seems to be associated with autism. And these do account for quite substantial um, 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 so, uh, reasons why one becomes autistic and also including um, having intellectual disability or other developmental disabilities. What's unique of these features of these genetic markers that they do not only have a relationship to autism or neuro neurodevelopmental issues, they may also impact a range of other physical components of the body. So knowing if one has a rare mutation, knowing whether this is actually quite important to know what to look for and what to be aware of. So, so count some genetic mutations that's um, like more associated with um, the, um, the likelihood of having obesity, for example, or the likelihood of developing schizophrenia. So if an autistic person has those uh, genetic markers, it is important to, uh, to follow up and see how it goes. So this is just to highlight some genetic factors actually have um, a, a wide array of effect that, that cuts across not only the mind, the brain, but also the body. And this is a scary plot, but let me walk you through because it takes me a lot of time to put things together. Okay, so the idea here is that we know autism is associated with a range of other conditions, which is marked in these uh, eclipse, these blue ones. So autism is often associated with physical health conditions, other you know, neurodevelopmental conditions. They may have feeding or eating problems, sleep problems, things being interpreted as disruptive behavior, anxiety, OCD, trauma, depression, substance use, and it could lead to even suicidality or premature mortality, and also bipolar and psychotic disorders. Now, the possible contributing factors to them are given in the side, uh, as a side. So I categorize them into four domains. The first major domain is how autistic people are treated generally by the context. 
which is what we call stigmatization and the experiences of being misunderstood. And possibly from some evidence and some clinical anecdotes, we know they at least contribute quite substantially to anxiety, to trauma experiences, to one being depressed, and maybe some behaviors being interpreted as disruptive. So that is an overarching phenomenon that needs to be taken care of. There are also specific um, adverse experiences that, for example, include what we call childhood adversity or being bullied or even acute stressful events, which can actually precipitate a severe mental health challenges during teenage, like depression or even psychotic disorder. And inappropriate health care can actually make it even harder to handle things. And these factors for sure contribute to anxiety, to trauma, to psychotic disorder, to suicidality, and at least depression as well. There is a range of cognitive features of autistic people. Not everyone has all of them, but some may have them. And they can have strengths, but also some challenges associated with that. And some of these cognitive features when interacting with the environmental demand can you know, increase the possibility of one's challenges. So these uh, uh, you know, wide ranging characteristics uh, from sensory perceptual changes, certainty seeking, so need things to be uh, the same, executive function difficulties, self-regulation or emotion regulation difficulties, ruminating thoughts in mind, uh, processing fear, and uh, how socially mot motivated one is, uh, communication difficulties or social coping difficulties. And again, these things can actually uh, associate with a, ran a wide range of challenges that people have. And finally, as mentioned earlier, there can be some shared um, early genetic or environmental factors, for example, to the severe mental illnesses or to feeding or sleep problems. So they can actually come from these factors. Although we mark all these, I think it's important for all of us to think about what are the um, what are the factors that can actually serve as a, as, a, as a shield for the effect of these to take part? So that's what we call resilience factors. So for example, addressing the, the problems of double empathy problem can actually shield one from experiencing stigmatization, can actually shield uh, an autistic person being repetitively misunderstood during healthcare and actually in the school setting uh, and even in the family setting in some cases as well. So these are these what we call resilience factors, I think, are also important ones to think about for, um, for, uh, from the pers uh, provider's perspective and for anyone who's actually uh, working with and supporting autistic people. So very quickly. Dr. Lai, sorry, yeah. before you continue, I'll just let you know we have about 15 minutes left. Perfect. Uh, so. I'll try to wrap up in two, three minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry about it. Okay, so I just want to provide a few links and I'll just leave this to you. These are for literacy, so uh, people can maybe use them to understand health care needs. And then uh, there a, there's a good resource from the UK about um, knowing your normal. And then there's a like local uh, resource generated from a York University in Cambridge from Dr. Jonathan Weiss and Rona, uh, Jona Lansky's group of a literacy guide. And again, you can find this one online, which is the general mental health tips for use, um, and it actually applies to adults. So these are very important tips to take good care of oneself, and I wouldn't read through them, but you're welcome to check it on online. This is just an example. This is something provided to healthcare professionals. So they have a guidance, a guideline document to say, okay, how do you cope with an autistic child have quote, problem behavior or irritability. But you can see from the direction to um, pediatricians actually, the first important thing is to assess safety. But the second important thing is to understand what's actually contributing to that. It's not giving medication directly. It's understanding, is it stress related issues? Is it change related issue? Is there some physical pain or some physical disorder happening? Is it a communication challenge? Is it a psychiatric um, illness that the child is experiencing or the adult is experiencing. So this is super important for us to think about. And finally, um, we may not have time to talk about all these, but just want to highlight some medications are being prescribed for autistic people when needed, and they're usually used for specific diagnosis or um, 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 uh, symptoms in some cases. And they range from ADHD to anxiety, depression, OCD, to self-regulation, to catatonia, and also other severe mental health illnesses. 
and another slide and really apologize I don't have time to go through but you will get it um, this is just a summary of how people usually adapt the existing uh, psychotherapeutic modalities so this is actually for clinicians like these are some adaptation methods that people can use to tailor the so-called evidence-based ones for um, autistic people and I think I need to point out one final thing which is uh, although many of the treatments so-called and intervention let's say for anxiety like CBT or DBT has its manual it's kind of like standardized format it is really important to follow what we call university this universal design principle so it is important to make sure the schedule and the material is accessible to autistic people and it needs to be tailored to the autistic person's uh, pace and thinking style for it to really take effect so i think that's the, the really the primary idea i want to share with all of you with that, I'll leave this to you. This is Dawn Triplett, which is the first autistic person being reported in the literature. And I'm really fascinated by his life, uh, his life experience. And this is actually from a description of his uh, teenage experiences in the book in a different key. And with that, I'll be happy to discuss with all of you about uh, any ideas may come up. Thank you so much, Dr. Lai. It's an incredible presentation, absolutely fascinating. It's the stuff that I love. Um, and I hope that everybody else felt the same. So I think now we can move on to some questions and answers. I saw a bunch in the chat that were already very interesting. The first one that I think I'll bring up is one that I think probably all of us are thinking, which is uh, other than, you know, the you know, life factors that we saw, why are those genetic factors that cause uh, different disorders so much more common in autistic people, especially the physical ones? It's so interesting that um, something that is generally seen as completely neurodevelopmental has so many common physical attributes. So why is that really? Yeah, that, that is a great question that I don't know exactly the answer. I think, I think the yeah, I think the challenge there is that, first of all, the, the genetic composition related to neurodevelopmental condition is quite complex. Mm -hmm. And when we say that, I think we know that at least um, the so-called rare changes play quite significant roles, but they do not apply to all autistic people. Like the frequency of the same change happening in autistic people actually is quite low. So there are at least more than 100 or more than 200 it's like rare changes has been identified to be associated but there are actually very low frequency of that across the whole autistic population what we know is that those rare changes usually um, function quite early in life so like during fetal development so during the development you know the, the body really doesn't separate the brain like directly from the you know the the body right mm -hmm. so so these these genetic factors have um have a downstream effect not only to the brain development but also to the physical side of things mm. so that might be one reason as a general you know explanation of why you have multiple um so like possible uh, outcomes having a genetic change yeah um, but i feel not so uh, equipped to answer that question in a more specific way but hope that can, no, that's you know, that absolutely can. helpful and it's very interesting to think about. So I think that we can all sort of have our own ideas on why our bodies do the things that we do. Um, Alex, did you have a question that you saw? I have another lined up, if not. Uh, what have you got lined up? Um, so one question that I saw that was very interesting is how can we avoid diagnostic overshadowing in autism? So specifically going to doctors and saying, I have this problem. And the doctor saying to us, that's just part of your autism. We don't have to deal with that. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. I mean, the overshadowing can go both ways, right? It can be that, you know, I have other conditions, but my autism is not recognized. So, mm. so, so, so it's a, it's a, it's a problem of recognizing autism. So in this case, it's almost like we, uh, you know, we as, you know, when we go to a, a healthcare provider, we almost need to be, unfortunately, more prepared to have the information about what happens during my lifetime and then, you know, to, to avoid that those being disregarded. Um, so that's, that's one part. The other part is that um, it's actually not, it's not actually not helpful to say this is your autism 
so it's not important, right? So I think the example of the atypical anxiety um, could be a good one. Mm -hmm. So for example, I may have a lot of anxiety related to change of you know, my schedule and other things, but it doesn't fit the generalized anxiety disorder diagnosis. And then to say, okay, you don't have a GAD diagnosis, so you don't have diagnosis, but yeah. I do have anxiety, right? So that doesn't mean that that anxiety cannot be uh, helped or overcome. So recognizing that, uh, that atypical presentation, if that's the term, uh, would be helpful. And it, I mean, it, you, you don't need a diagnosis for you to be helped. I think that's mm. another key, right? The system is quite rigid in some cases yeah. that you have to have a diagnosis, but it's not, it doesn't make sense if I can say that. Yeah, that's a really wonderful point. Thank you. And I'll absolutely echo that for everybody to remember that, you know, the diagnosis is not the end all be all. Your experiences are true and valid. Absolutely. Are there any more questions? I'll um, see one. One that I might ask you to touch on, Dr. Lai. Um, you know, uh, I I see a lot of comments about you know uh, dismissal of mental health uh, issues with autistic people. Uh, there's also you know we've talked a bit about misdiagnosis. I'm wondering when you have a person who you know maybe is diagnosed later in life with autism but previously had received a lot of mental health conditions how do we actually know whether or not those previous uh diagnoses are misdiagnosed or if they are co-occurring that's a great question we need another hour to that but uh, i think that's a that's a re that's a really great one so for example um I, I will come back to that anxiety example, right? So if I have a lot of anxiety related to the change of my schedule, and later I'm recognized that you know having autism because of other histories, that anxiety can be understood and explained. If I was given a generalized anxiety disorder diagnosis prior to you know to autism, then you know we now understand that may not be called generalized and uh, generalized anxiety. It is anxiety related to autism. So in a way, you can argue that generalized anxiety is not uh, correct, um, but it doesn't mean that anxiety challenge doesn't exist, right? So, so, so it's still a co-occurring issue. It's just not uh, correctly labeled by the, by the diagnosis given prior to. And, and it, it does vary depending on you know, other things. So for example, autistic people, some autistic people may be misdiagnosed as being psychotic at some point of time. So for example, some of these being, being asked this screening question, have you ever heard uh, voices when there's no one around? And I said, yes, because I'm hearing the radio. I'm actually listening to something, there's no one around. So it's my literal response to that, right? And that screening question, if led to a suspicion of a psychotic experiences like hallucination, then if unfortunately, for whatever reason, this person has gotten a psychotic disorder diagnosis you know, attached, and it's a misdiagnosis, then that's actually a big problem because that actually leads to other uh, mental health um, treatment even related or medication use related issues. So in that case, that misdiagnosis is a serious one to be you know, reconsidered well. Um, um, so I, I guess my point here is that if a person being recognized as autistic, then the importance is to understand the person's experiences from that lens and to understand what's probably mislabeled, what's probably still co-occurring, and what's not explained by autistic uh, features. I mean, a, an autistic person can still develop schizophrenia, which needs to be recognized, which needs to be treated as early as possible, right? So we cannot really say a person's idiosyncratic, quote unquote, speech is totally autistic. It may not be. So, so I think that's where I would, I would, I would start. And I think we'll probably just take one more since we're closing up on time um, from our Q&A box. Why are we told that it's just autism, even if mental health issues are apparent? And then they followed up, particularly for those with significant autism who cannot share their feelings. Parents are dismissed by psychiatrists. I think that might be a follow up to possibly the uh, two way diagnostic overshadowing. Yeah, I, I, I guess some emotional response on that. I mean, if, if autistic person, if you if you argue that seventy percent or at least autistic person have mental health challenges, then then what could it be like just autistic, right? I mean, it, it just doesn't make sense. So, I mean, yeah, I think I think um, 
it's not just autism. It's autism explains the, uh, the, the, the person's life experiences. And as non-autistic clinicians, I think we strive to understand the person's, the autistic person's experiences. And through that lens, we try to understand what's happening there. And then we think together with the autistic person and family to think about what might work, what might not work. So I just don't buy the, it's just autism. Mm. 